All right, welcome everyone to the last panel. So we're all going to have to come up with other reasons as to why we're going to ignore our, all our emails from tomorrow. Um, but we're still here for now. So we are in the last panel, which is negotiating politics in nostalgic genres and codes. So we've got quite a bit of time. We've got uh, lots of different speakers on some amazing different topics. Uh, so uh, yeah, I guess we can just start kicking it off. Um, so first up, we've got Bruce. Bruce, if you're there. Hi. I'm here. Yeah. You hear me? Uh, yep, yeah, Bruce. Um, do you pronounce your last name Lay or Lie? Lie. Lie. Great. All right. Um, so I'll just introduce you first. Um, so Bruce Lai is a PhD candidate in the Film Studies Department at King's College London. His thesis is about Chinese comedy films since 2000 and neoliberalization. He is a film critic and a member of the Hong Kong Film Critics Society. So Bruce. Whenever you're ready, you can share your screen and kick things off. Okay. Uh, can you see uh, the PowerPoint I'm showing now? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's start. The man child. Um, Today I'm going to talk about uh, man child comedy films in the 21st century China with the case studies of the comedian Wang Baojiang. The man child is an ever popular trope in comedy films from the silent era to the early 21st century. In the Western context, criticism show worries about the negative cultural influences of the celebration of man child comedies after the year 2000. An essential behavioral trait of a man child is that he always wants to play but not work. Uh, when critics talk about immaturity as a problem of man child, they often talk about irresponsibility. In the context of Chinese comedies in the past two decades, there are two comedians who are representative of two kinds of man child. One representative is Wang Baoqiang, uh, with his bumpkin characters, who can serve as a critique of those Chinese men with e ethical failings. So it is a positive image of the man child. The second type is represented by comedian Shen Teng, whose image is similar to those Western mainstream type who is playful and irresponsible. Let me briefly introduce the man child as a trope in film comedy. And the book Duxi's book, I Won't Grow Up, is a major reference, uh, which has a systematic investigation of this trope. The term man child refers to a childish man uh, physically growing up who is immature in terms of conduct and mentality. There are varieties and transition of the man child in the history of Western film comedy. Uh, man child's immaturity refers to the incapabil incapability or unwillingness to take responsibilities, especially the duties to protect and provide for one's family. Baduji investigates the topic chronologically and based on his book, now I map out the varieties of the man child regarding different life states. Uh, the first type of man child are those who have not grown up yet. So they are physically but not mentally grown up. Most of them are innocent in act and vulnerable, and uh, they may show no uh, uh, sense of sexuality. And most of them are playful, uh, sometimes naughty or even wild. The second types are those who are growing up. So uh, they are more sophisticated than those in type one. Uh, and some towards uh, sexuality, some of them has a uh, beginning to have little sense of it, but uh, some of them are still indifferent or confused about sex. The third type are those who are refusing to grow up. They're not innocent, uh, but embracing childishness as something natural and they reject adulthood and responsibility. They are hedonistic, self-centered, and sometimes explicitly sexual, and they could be smart. The fourth type of man-child uh, refers to juven rejuvenation and regression, it refers to those adults who escape from crisis or trauma in adulthood and seek a haven in childhood or adolescence. The position of these four types of man-child in relation to life stages can be plotted like this. Type 1 and 2 are related to the ability to grow up. 
about types three and four about the willingness to grow up. I propose this typology is comprehensive and also useful for locating different man charm images in Chinese comedies. Wang Baoqiang became famous uh, by playing man child roles in the first decade of his family film career, including those in Lost on Journey and Lost in Thailand. For convenience, I'll call these two films Journey and Thailand, respectively, and call both films the Lost Comedies together. They are role buddy comedies in which Wang co star with Xu Zhong, who plays the anxious, sophisticated entrepreneur. One's character in Journey belongs to type one, whereas in Thailand is closer to type two, which is a bit more sophisticated. Shen Teng became a national star comedian with the success of Goodbye Mr. Loser in 2015, which his character moves between type three and four as he appears street smart, but irresponsible as a husband. And he returns to his high school years in time, in time trouble to 1997, which is a regression. This loser has a second chance of development and he takes advantage with the knowledge as someone from the future to pursue success. And this film, nostalgia for the school years and pop cultures in the 1990s almost, is a source of amusement. However, because of time limits, I will focus on Wang Baoqiang's man child comedies today. Lost on Journey and Lost in Thailand share a similar plot structure. The two protagonists co co coincidentally become robots, but each of them has its own agenda. And throughout the journey, they, their incongruities create laughter, but they finally become friends. Wang Baoqiang, in these films, he had played many characters who are childish and obstinate bumpkins in the first decades of his careers. Besides the buddy role comedies, uh, Journey and Thailand, there is a less than successful comedy, Jack of All Trades, in which Wang's bumpkin man child character not only turns a snobbish, snobbish white collar man into an altruistic friend, but he also donates his corneas to a blind girl he loves. Once childish bumpkin characters in the lost comedies move between the first and the second type of man child whose mentality does not grow up with the body. His character Bao Bao in Thailand is a bit more sophisticated than Liu Gan in Journey. Bao Bao is here. Liu Gan is this one. However, both of them are starkly childish in contrast to other protagonists played by Xu Zheng whose characters are entrepreneurial subjects who put most effort to chase after personal interests. Once Bumpkin man child characters in two lost comedies as well as other roles on the cinema and TV screens are reminiscent of the socialist icon Lei Feng, according to Korea Strauss, who examines Wang soldier characters Xu San Duo in a TV series Soldier Sorti, arguing that Wang's and Wadi's personalities are both proletariat every man and soldier hero like Lei Feng, who is industrious, selfless, loyal and innocent. Thus Wang has won support among many audiences from the working class and the military. But I propose that Wang's man child image registers a nostalgic acknowledgement of the socialist legacy as well as the Confucian tradition. In the lost comedies, Liu and Bao Bao, but their innocence and kindness suggest that Corrupt adults could learn from children or childish characters. Once roles blend morality, kindness, and childlikeness in one person, in contrast to Xu Zheng's roles, who embody urbanity, egoism, and maturity. It's such kind of characterization can be read as a social critique by nostalgia that is, as Chinese society has become mostly worshipping during the reform period, it looks back to the past or home as a source of cultural solution to present problems. When Chinese people experience the adverse effects of social political change, a variety of nostalgia emerges as a counterbalance being captured in popular culture, according to Xiaodeliu. Harry Kuo Su studies Wang's 
naive characters in his non-comedic themes, suggesting that the nostalgia for innocence and nostalgia for home expressed by Wang's characters help him to gain popularity among the migrant workers against the background of rapid mechanization of society with the backlash of moral degradation. In the lost comedies, the childish pumpkins appear as targets of laughter because they seem inferior to the middle class entrepreneurial subjects who represent social norms. In the reform era, making money for one's interests has become the dominant drive of everyday life and being a good citizen means being a successful entrepreneur who is rational, calculating, and profit making. So, how do Wang's man child characters in the loss on journey and loss in Thailand pose a critique of normal entrepreneurial subjectivity? These roles embody two levels of nostalgia. First, as the man child with good qualities, they apparently show the nostalgia for an earlier life stage. Second, looking back to China's past, including the revolutionary nostalgia for Mao's era and the Confucian tradition. The nostalgic association with the socialist era may be more applicable to the case of Wang's character in TV series Soldier Softy. His characters in films, particularly the lost comedies, are better examined in relation to other aspects of nostalgia. First, the nostalgia for childhood as utopian nostalgia. Adam Buller argues that the children's characters in some European heritage films render nostalgia as utopian cosmopolitan idealism. This innocent children embody universal virtues that have formed the moral critique of colonial thoughts and cultures. Their kindness and openness reveal a longing for the lost protection of mankind. What is that the ideal is not the past but figures of the children. Utopian nostalgia is not really a longing for the historical past as a lost ideal, but it implicates a tempor temporal ambiguity that we project our moral ideals on the children or childhood. As these ideals are regarded as humanity's lost virtues, the future expectation is projected to the past. Childlikeness could be virtuous because children are thought to be clean from the less than ideal norms and customs of adults. This is in sharp contrast to Padushi's assumption that mean maturity means lack of virtue. In other words, although the nostalgia for childhood operates through manifestations of pastness, such pastness is more imaginative than factual. Therefore, I suggest that childlike qualities of Wang Baochang's character could also embody people's projection of lost moral ideals as a result of a disappointment of the status quo even though these ideals to be redeemed might not really exist in the past. Once characters assume an innate kindness of children, if we compare the characters in different comedies, the more rustic and childish he is, the more nostalgic feeling he may induce, and a greater kindness is shown. In Thailand, he is a small shop owner, an urbanized playful mama's boy, who is sometimes naughty and troublemaking, but usually kind. In Journey, he is a sacked dairy farm worker who is ignorant and innocent, but generous that he is willing to help a woman who raises funds for her ill child, and he does not regret it even when it turns out to be a fraud. In Jack of All Trades, he is a rural young man who has just left the village. He trusts a city man right after they have met, and sacrifices his eyesight for the blind girl he loves, and returns home alone. If gullibility and self-sacrifice without regret are signs of selflessness, these qualities pose a challenge to those who are blinded by self-interest. The entrepreneurial subjects preoccupied with individual refinement and materialistic achievement. Once fan child characters in lost comedies embody lingering virtues from the past, especially altruism that has been lost during the period of neoliberalization when self-interest is elevated. However, I argue such nostalgia for selflessness has a closer link to Confucianism than to socialism. The comical characterization of Wang's man child characters shows a dimension of interpersonal ethics that problematize the neoliberal discourse of self entrepreneurship, especially about family and home. Svetlana Boim defines nostalgia as longing for a lost home, a sentiment of displacement which is also which is quote, also a ro romance with one's own fantasy, end of quote, as the home may have never existed. She distinguished 
differences between the restorative and reflective nostalgia. While restorative nostalgia stresses the homeland and assumes the truth about our community's origin, reflective nostalgia stretches longing with an open attitude. Moreover, nostalgia can also be prospective instead of retrospective. As prospective nostalgia addresses the present needs and explores future potentialities. Nostalgia embodied by Wang's characters is close to the reflective type as it doesn't refer to a concrete historical preference. Rather, it takes the form of a big sense of loss. The incongruity between the childish pumpkin and the entrepreneurial man not only creates laughter, but also recalls the lost values and costs of the ruthless process of marketization in China. There's a link between Chinese comedies and homecoming. That many comedy films have been shown in the New Year's period, and many migrant workers return to their hometowns. Comedies that are shown in this period are often called New Year's films in China. In many Chinese comedies, family plays an, e an essential role for the well being of the people, while the shared anxiety of entrepreneurial subjects is revealed in relation to family and other interpersonal issues. Conventionally, a responsible Chinese man should work hard to make his family live well, which may be a constitutive part of Chinese entrepreneurial subject that wants to perform well in both career and family. However, Xu Zhen's character in the lost comedies showed the internal conflict within the model of a hardworking breadwinner as a responsible family man, as his preoccupation with work can erode his care for the family. These characters, Li Changgong and Xu Lang, this is Li Changgong, this is Xu Lang. Are typical neoliberal entrepreneurial subjects who are calculating, self-interested, and sometimes transgressive. However, the pursuit of career success could in turn make one lost. In journey, Li fails his family because he has an extramarital affair and passes the responsibility to take care of the family to his wife. In Thailand, Xu Lang is a workaholic who ignores his family duties. His an absent father and his wife files for divorce, but he doesn't care because he's preoccupied with his business project. Both of them are lonely men who have no friends. This man pursuing personal success are indeed losers in terms of interpersonal relationships. Wang's Fan Chao characters carry ambivalent effects to Xu's characters, and that the former is both troublesome and helpful. At first, the entrepreneur who only cares about his own business sees the man child as a troublemaker because he brings about detours and distractions. But later there's a shift of agenda because of the man child. Whose kindness makes the entrepreneur change his priority and learns how to be generous and responsible, especially for one's family. The word lost in the film titles hints the entrepreneurial protagonist detours in the journey as well as the ethical crisis. This echoes with the notion of reflective nostalgia, according to point that often has an off modern tendency, distracting the agenda of unilateral progression, which are embraced by the entrepreneurial subjects. Therefore, details and distractions caused by the man child can be moments of reflection. While the entrepreneur focuses on his pursuit ahead, the man child draws him back, turning the attention to nostalgic longing for the lost virtues and home referring to a reflective nostalgia, opening up new possibilities for one to reset one's goal and value system in life, referring to the prospective nostalgia. The pumpkin man child characters have the lost entrepreneurs realize how to be better men who are responsible for their families and grateful for others who have contributed to their success. In the lost comedies, the entrepreneur protagonists finally enjoy the family reunion as the biggest prize and they are thankful for the man child Buddies. After all, interclass social harmony has replaced class struggle in the reform era. Although the nostalgic legacy of socialism may be spotted in one by Chan's man child image, the resolution rests on family and harmony instead of revolutionary self sacrifice demonstrated by Li Hong. The Chinese state has used the discourse of social harmony in the early 21st century as a response to the increasing instances of social unrest resulting from ruthless mobilization, where the working class has spawned great courts. This discourse is echoed in lost, lost comedies that Wang's man-child compliments, but not subverts 
neoliberal entrepreneurial subjectivity by nostalgia, by which neoliberal entrepreneurial subject has to redeem what has been lost and strike a balance between economic success and home. So this is the conclusion. In this article, I have examined Wang Bao Chan's comedic image of a bumpkin man child as pre presenting a different kind of man child in global cinema than the recent Hollywood model. Examining Locks on Journey and Locks in Thailand, I've shown that Wang's image functions as a social cultural critique of the norms of the calculating self interested entrepreneurial subjectivity. However, the Chinese man child, unlike many Western counterparts, can be both a target of joke and a virtuous role model. The humor of a Chinese man child comedy starring Wang Bao Chang often comes from the man child's ignorance and his conflicts with the entrepreneurial body. I've also examined how the bumpkin man child's critique works through our uh, nostalgia for the utopian goodness projected to childhood and longing for home as a source of cultural reflection. The man child's altruism refers more to the Confucian tradition of family values and social harmony, but I argue that it complements but not denies the entrepreneurial subjectivity. Thank you. Wow, that's totally kept a time. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, all right, up next is Cody and Autumn, if you're there. Um, so Cody Parrish serves as the coordinator of the Red One uh, Honors Program at Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, Texas. He holds a master's degree in English, literary and cultural studies from Illinois State University, and his research spans horror cinema, literature, and culture. His current research examines nostalgia and trauma in recent American horror films. And Autumn Fredline is a senior honors student pursuing a Bachelor of Arts degree in English, sociology, and political science at Midwestern State University. Their research interests include deity theory, LGBTQ plus studies, and power structures. So they're here for, to present their paper, Champion, Championing America's Losers, Resolving the Culture Wars in the It Adaptations. So take it away. All right. Thank you, Dr. Howland. We appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us for the session, uh, for, to the conference organizers for giving us the opportunity to share this research. Give me one second. I'm going to uh, share my screen. Can y'all see that? Yeah. Perfect. All right, so we made one, one small change to the title because we felt like resolving might be a little bit of a strong uh, word. So we changed it to navigating the culture wars and the it adaptations. So memory, it's a funny thing. The character Mike tells viewers in the opening voiceover of Andy Muschietti's at chapter two the sequel to it, chapter one. People want to believe they are what they choose to remember. The good stuff, the moments, the places, the people we all hold on to. What Mike is talking about here is nostalgia. And ever since 2015, the United States has been engrossed in the nostalgia zeitgeist. This latest nostalgic turn in American history is characterized by the cultural shift toward the values, attitudes, politics, aesthetics, trends and media of the 1980s and also the 1990s. Its onset coincided with the US presidential election primaries and was especially fueled by then candidate Donald Trump who ran in the Republican primaries. Hollywood has happily fed consumers cravings for 80s nostalgia, releasing sequels to the mega popular 80s franchise Star Wars and to the sci-fi classic Blade Runner, as well as rebooting the Ghostbusters film series among others. The Netflix original series Stranger Things owes its, cult, its status as a cultural phenomenon to its entertaining simulation of 80s aesthetic and characters through intertextual references to 80s pop culture, especially to Stephen King's 1986 novel It. The release of new film adaptations of It would prove themselves to be defining events to, of the nostalgia zeitgeist in their own right. In it chapter one, amongst the trials of growing up, contrary to idealized society and fending off bullies, a group of seven outcasts band together to suppress Pennywise, evil incarnate in the shape of a dancing, shape-shifting clown preying on the children of Derry, Maine. In it chapter two, after 27 years of reprieve, the childhood friends that originally defeated Pennywise must return to Derry to finish what they started, 
unraveling the truth of both the evil clown and the forgotten childhoods in the process. Ultimately, both films were incredibly successful, chapter one grossing over 325 million domestically and 700 million globally, becoming the highest grossing horror film of all time without adjusting for inflation. Chapter two experienced similar blockbuster success, grossing over 210 million domestically and 470 million globally. This being the case, it's clear that the two films resonated deeply with audiences during the present cultural historical moment. This is because the adaptations together serve as a cultural flashpoint in American cinematic history, presenting a critical analysis of power and deviancy as they concern the American culture wars of the late 2010s, which ignited the ongoing nostalgia zeitgeist that we see today. As such, the adaptations offer insight and tools with which to navigate the intricacies and implications of the culture wars. As sociologist James Davidson Hunter explains in his influential essay, The Enduring Culture War. The culture wars are battles between traditionalists, commonly referred to as conservatives, and progressivists, also known as liberals, over what it means to be American. Ever resistant to change, conservatives believe in a vision of America entrenched in the achievements and traditions of the past, while liberals embrace as, uh, change as a necessary part of the nation's evolution into a more tolerant, more perfect union. Notably, historian Andrew Hartman points out that the culture wars intensify during tumultuous times of rapid change. One of the most turbulent eras of American history was the 1960s, which is when the American culture wars exploded into being, with the civil rights movement, women's and gay liberation fronts, the anti-Vietnam war protests, and the countercultural revolution all occurring simultaneously. The culture wars flared in the 1970s following the controversial Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion and flared again in the 1990s over the role of religion in public education systems and obscenity standards in media. Ever since the inauguration of President Barack Obama in 2009, the first president of color in American history, the flames of the culture wars have once again intensified, swelling into the blaze it is today. The key issues of the American culture wars thus seem to be civil rights in all of its forms, the role of religion in schools, and media censorship. No other political figure has spanned the flames of the culture wars more brazenly than President Donald Trump, who openly ran on a vision of America rooted in racism, xenophobia, sexism, and anti-intellectualism, among many other isms. Trump's campaign message resonated deeply with white conservative Americans nostalgic for the 1980s. Trump's enormous appeal stemmed from his deliberate attempts to invoke and emulate former President Ronald Reagan, who led the country for most of the 80s decade and who has long been idolized by conservative voters as the greatest Republican president in American history, second only to Abraham Lincoln. To marginalized communities, however, Trump appeared as an all-American boogeyman, as an amorphous it embodying the anxieties of each community, a connection not lost on even the creators of the animated television series South Park. Trump raised fears of a reactionary return to a decade during which minorities had fewer legal rights and faced more aggressive forms of discrimination. In Trump's vision of America, minorities like women, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, and the disabled are monsters. Historian W. Scott Poole writes, the marginalized are the monstrous and the monstrous is marginalized. The monster, more than our fears, also represents our hatreds. The monster is the sickening other. Moreover, Poole claims that monsters are symbols of deviance, which is an important concept to understand when considering how the Losers Club gained their moniker. Putting it simply, deviancy can be described as the act of existing and behaving contrary to the rules and expectations of a community. As deviance relies heavily on social interpretation, ideas of what is deviant and what is not deviant vary highly by community and over time. It's important to note that just because something is labeled as deviant by society um, does not necessarily mean there is something morally wrong with the individual labeled as such. This simply means that the community in which the individual resides regards the deviant as outside of the norm due to its majority opinion or the opinion of those in power. This then reveals a connection between the culture wars, identity politics, and deviance. As deviance is not a black and white concept and varies based on communal position, it goes to reason that individuals within a community have different perceptions of what is deviant and normal or bad and good. Um, this leads to opposition over communal values and sparks conflict over the establishment of norms and the definition of deviant in a set space. 
That being said, despite possession, most people can be considered deviant in some form or another, especially by the majority, say by dyeing their hair neon green or going outside in the snow without a coat. However, some deviant labels become a core element of an individual's perceived identity, particularly in the perspective of the dominant group. These labels are considered master statuses. A master status is typically ascribed or a feature of behavior an individual carries from birth, something uncontrollable but still seen as outside of that norm of their community. In the case of it, a master status characterizes each of the central characters, creating a deviant group considered outcast by society. For example, Mike is black, Bev is a woman, Bill is disabled, Stan is Jewish, Men does not possess that idealized body image, Richie is gay, and Eddie does not conform to traditional masculinity. Finding comfort in their identities, these seven create the Losers Club, a group that finds these differences normal, flipping that narrative and alleviating their deviant statuses in the process. In relation to modern America, this group symbolizes and takes the form of marginalized identities in the US. However, a core aspect of deviance and the existence of deviance in a community is that those in power will sanction the deviants either through punishment or in efforts to force them into conformity as a measure of solidifying and upholding the values of the community. In the case of it, the sanctioning group would be Pennywise and the bullies, namely Henry Bowers and his followers. It's important to note that this group most closely resembles the traditional conservative and dominant demographic of the US, the conservative straight white man. As such, the struggle between the deviant and sanctioning groups in it mirrors the culture war still raging in the US today. This can be seen in each of the communities represented by the seven members of the Losers Club. First, we have Mike, who carries his master status as a result of his race, as he is Black. Um, he is typically policed by Bowers through efforts at banishment and expulsion, as evidenced when Bowers tells him to stay the fuck out of my town and that you should have burned just like your druggy parents. Pennywise, who takes the form of, of an individual's greatest fears, manifests to Mike as the hands of Black people trying to escape a burning building and a lich corpse hanging from a chain. This symbolizes the violent history of racism in the U.S. and taps into the ongoing Black Lives Matter and the new civil rights movements. Next, we have Bev, who carries her master status as a result of her sex as she is a woman. Bev is policed in two fashions, one by other women like Greta through public humiliation, and two by grown men through sexual objectification and abuse. Pennywise first manifests to Bev as blood and hair clogging up her bathroom sink. The hair alludes to her cutting her short and deviating from traditional femininity, while the blood refers to her menstrual cycle and the process of becoming a grown woman and thus fertile. Her experiences represent the U.S.'s history of sexual assault and abuse, um, typically by men in power, and taps into the recent Me Too and Time's Up movements. The ostensible leader of the Losers Club is Bill, who carries his master status as a result of his disability, a speech impediment. Henry Bowers polices Bill by openly mocking his stutter in an early confrontation outside their school. Uh, Pennywise also ridicules Bill, mirroring his stutter during their climactic showdown in the sewers. Bill's struggles represent the challenges faced by the disability community, tapping into the ongoing disability rights movement active today. We also have Stan, who carries his master status as a result of his Jewish ethnicity and religion. Patrick Hockstetter, one of Bowers' goons, Police's stand by shoving him to the ground and ripping off his yarmulke, deriding it as a frisbee as he launches it into a passing school bus. Separately, Pennywise manifests to Stan as a disfigured woman from a painting in his rabbi's office, representing Stan's anxiety surrounding his bar mitzvah and his looming rite of passage into adulthood. Stan's struggles reflect the anti-Semitism that has pervaded American history, especially since President Trump took office in 2017. Continuing on, we have Ben, who carries his master status as a result of his embodiment, as he is overweight and therefore does not conform to the societal expectations of beauty. He's policed in numerous ways, most notably through verbal or physical punishments, such as when Bowers attempts to carve his name into Ben's stomach with a switchblade, or when others refer to him as fat, fat ass, or cottage cheese. Um, Pennywise also polices Ben in this fashion by referring to him as fat boy, gross, and disgusting. Ben's struggles highlight embodiment issues and unattainable beauty standards, tapping into the emerging body positivity movement. Now we have Richie, who carries his 
master status as a result of his sexuality as he is gay. Ritchie is most clearly policed through the use of pejoratives like fairy and the Essler by Bowers and his associates. Pennywise first appears to Ritchie as a clown, alluding to the stereotype of gay men as a caricature with clown-like, overly flamboyant behavior and suggesting Ritchie's fear of appearing as such to not only his peers, but to society as a whole. The struggles he faces in the films represent the denials of LGBTQ plus rights throughout history, as well as the ongoing fight of the community today. And finally, we have Eddie, who carries his master status as a result of his gender performance, as he does not comply with traditional ideas of masculinity. Eddie's policed through alternative treatment by others, and his mother in particular, via Munchausen syndrome by proxy, suggesting an assumption that he's weak and sick simply due to his perceived frailness, despite not truly being so. Going along in this vein, Pennywise manifests Eddie as a leper, nodding again to the assumption that he is weak and therefore vulnerable to illness and disease. Eddie's struggles represent the perceived crisis of masculinity and the emasculation of America, tapping into the emergence of masculinity studies and the whole concept of toxic masculinity. With modified temporal settings of 1989 and 2016, and each member of the Losers Club representing a different deviant or marginalized community, and then Pennywise, the embodiment of hegemony, manifesting to each loser as their deepest fear, persecution, oppression, and death. The allegory of the American culture is present in these films takes a very clear form. Derry, Maine becomes a microcosm of the United States, with a cultural battle being waged between the Losers Club, a coalition of marginalized identities seeking to end systemic oppression on the left, and the town bullies, the dominant groups enforcers seeking to maintain the hegemonic status quo on the right. As Pennywise incites the town bullies to violence against the Losers Club, while onlookers turn a blind eye, Derry dons the coveted role of the shining city on a hill in American lore, the idyllic small town mythologized by nostalgia that Americans so long for. Yet, like the U.S., um, Derry's charm is shattered once its repressed history of violence and discrimination comes to light. While reading in the public library, Ben discovers Derry has quite the horrific history. In 1719, Derry was established, though not long after the charter signing, 91 signees disappeared that winter. In 1908, an explosion occurred at an Easter egg hunt, killing 102 people, including 88 children. In 1935, three police officers and two gang members were killed in a shootout. And in 1962, a racist cult burned down the Black Spot nightclub, killing all of those inside. It's important to draw attention to the fact that it, or Pennywise, is shown to be present through all of these events, reinforcing the allegorical connection between the horrific events of Derry and, by extension, those of the U.S. Reading about and experiencing firsthand the bloody underbelly hidden beneath the illusion of nostalgia, the losers must determine how to end the cycle of violence in Derry, as well as the cycle of nostalgia that shields it. See, memory's the thing, Mike tells Bill. It's the key to everything. And he's right. In order to defeat Pennywise once and for all, the losers must return home to Derry, to the past. Not a glorious past produced by nostalgic omission, but one stained in the gore of history's losers. Mike, Bev, Bill, Ben, Richie, and Eddie must collectively remember the pain and fear they felt as children growing up in a dangerous world and channel those feelings into meaningful action against hegemony itself rather than hegemony's enforcers. In doing so, the losers vanquish Pennywise down in the sewers and seize the power that it previously withheld from them. Therefore, if culture wars are struggles over power, and nostalgia reinforces the disempowerment of deviant or marginalized communities, then the it adaptations demonstrate that a clear cultural memory of the past, as well as the courage to confront the horrors that reside there, is necessary to dispel the illusion of nostalgia and begin dismantling the harmful power structures it seeks to preserve. Thank you. Okie doke. Wow, great, great stuff. Um, it definitely seems to be coming up as a key text for nostalgia today. All right, uh, next up is Matthew Leggett. Um, he is here to present his paper, A Stranger Sort of Nostalgia, Texture, Texture, Prosthesis and Politics. Matthew is a senior lecturer at the University of Winchester and program leader of the English Literature and American Studies programs there. 
He is editor of a forthcoming collection titled Was It Yesterday? Nostalgia in Contemporary Film and Television, due for publication uh, in June later this year. He's also author of Culture and Political Nostalgia in the Age of Terror, and a number of book chapters and journal articles on contemporary film and literature. So Matthew, when you're ready. Just uh, sharing the screen, thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, okay, hopefully you can all see this okay. Um, first of all, uh, you know, Ooh, massive thank you. You can't. I know, can anyone else see it? Oh, can I share it? Oh, hang on, I didn't press share. You've got to press the share button, that helps. There you go. I'm used to using Teams and not yes. um, <laughs> and not uh, Zoom, sorry. Um, yeah, all good. Uh, great. Um, massive thanks, I think, to, to Laura, Shelley, Caitlin for putting this on. It's been it's been really great and a uh, pleasure to be be here and see so many great papers. Um, and thanks to Lindsay for um, sharing. It's a bit of a, a kind of Frankenstein's monster of a paper, this one, in that um, it's kind of put together from a couple of pieces from the book. The first is the introduction, um, which I've kind of um, done a hatchet job on. And then the second is, is my chapter on uh, Ready Player One. And I've taken the part about sort of prosthetic memory out of that and, and shoved it into here. I hope it kind of works as a whole, but apologies if it doesn't. Uh, the pressure is slightly on because there are two people um, in the audience who, who actually have contributed papers to, to the book, um, Christina and Tracy. So uh, hopefully, I don't, I do it some justice. Um, so uh, yeah, the paper's called A Stranger Sort of Nostalgia, uh, Texture, Prosthesis and Politics. Um, it might be a bit of a false sell because I don't talk lots about Stranger Things, a little bit here, um, but um, more, I'm more interested in, in the kind of uh, thinking about nostalgia more broadly here. So uh, I'm, without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll get going. Um, oh, whoop, back. Okay. Um, I want to start with a quote by Paul Virilio. Um, Virilio writes that uh, the entirety of our history is now being written at the speed of light, which is to say in nanoseconds, picoseconds and femtoseconds. Whereas the organization of time was previously based on hours and minutes, we no longer live even in a world of seconds. We live in a world of infinitely tiny units of time. Um, so in the spring of 2018, as I first sat down and began to pen ideas for how to open a collection of papers on nostalgia in contemporary film and television that I was editing for SUNY Press, shameless plug, um, I was suddenly struck by the uncanny symmetry between the worlds of culture and politics that I was at that very moment inhabiting. My partner and I had decided to catch up on The Americans, a Joe Weisberg creation then in its sixth and final season. We were on the fourth. For those who aren't familiar with it, The Americans, an FX television show that first aired back in 2013, follows the exploits of two deep cover KGB spies, Elizabeth and Philip Jennings, played by Kerry Russell and Matthew Rhys, and their family as they attempt to navigate the perils of a job that involves them in numerous undercover operations, all while trying to maintain the appearance of normality in 1980s America. Much of the plot for season four revolves around the couple's uh, attempts to smuggle biological weapons being developed by their American adversaries out of the country and to the Soviet Union. Strange, I thought, given that at that very moment, Sergei Skripal, a former Russian counterintelligence operative for the UK government and his daughter Yulia lay recovering in a hospital some weeks after they had been the target of an attempted murder by shadow figures in the Kremlin or so the UK government insisted. That this attack had happened in Salisbury using a military grade nerve agent in broad daylight, some 50 miles away from my quiet hometown on the south coast of England, was like something straight out of fiction. The event, which, uh, however, which dominated the UK media for about a week before disappearing, feels already like nothing more than a footnote. Like so many similar political instances, such events serve to demonstrate the increasing ephemerality of the public memory. As Virilio suggests, history is being written at the speed of light. How could one possibly remember? And yet, when it comes to the film and television we've been enjoying over the last decade, remembering, albeit not very accurately, 
seems to be virtually all we have been doing, as this uh, conference to some extent attests. Um, of the nine Best Picture Oscar winners between 2011 and 2019, The King's Speech, The Artist, Argo, 12 Years a Slave, Birdman, Spotlight, Moonlight, The Shape of Water and Green Book, only one was set in the present. And even that movie, Birdman, was a story about memory. It's not to say that all these movies are explicitly about nostalgia, they certainly aren't, but they do seem to speak of our obsession with the past. If we take Green Book, for example, it is difficult to argue that the movie encourages a longing for the 1960s, given its depiction of the racism and homophobia encountered by Dr. Donald Shirley, but the use of the iconic 1962 Cadillac driven by Tony Lip does lend an air of romance to the road trip which is the subject of the movie. Such movies often seem to appeal through what one might refer to as the texture of the past. Rather than operate on the narrative level, nostalgia is instead evoked via the aestheticization of the period setting to which the viewer is transported. Where these Oscar winners might evoke nostalgia for their periods in a formal sense, the recent flurry of Disney films seems to show the industrial process at its most ruthlessly efficient. And when you think about it, it's a great marketing strategy. If you were 10 when Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Aladdin uh, or The Lion King came out in the early 1990s, there's a good chance that if you've had them, your children might be about 10 when the remakes hit the screens in 2017 and 2019. So your nostalgia becomes the perfect excuse to take your 10 year old child to the cinema. Since their releases, I have often wondered, however, what the point of the live action remakes are, given that Disney's 1990s animation techniques don't really age. In fact, the remakes will probably age more rapidly. But given their box office success, it would appear that Disney have found a formula that works. Of course, this doesn't mean we can't enjoy nostalgia. Toy Story 4, for example, showed that Disney can still turn original narratives which mobilise nostalgia in order to get patrons through the doors, but which ultimately have a heartbeat of their own. However, there is a sense that these new old movies are in some way haunted by the ghosts of their original. Um, is it possible, for example, to watch the new Aladdin movie without comparing Will Smith's performance as the genie, unfavourably, I might add, to Robin Williams' show-stealing work in the first movie. Likewise, why is it that James L. Jones, uh, for some reason, a blank, oh, there he is. Uh, James L. Jones reprises his role as Mufasa in the live-action Lion King, where other stars like Jeremy Irons, uh, who voiced Scar, are missing. Um, presumably, L. Jones there is uh, happy because of the bumper paycheck he got, whereas Irons is, is left out of that. Um, Mufasa, uh, Mufasa's ghostly presence quite literally seems to haunt the movie, perhaps. And all of these decisions, of course, become talking points for fans who crowd internet fora. And while it's true that Disney's takeover of Lucasfilm in 2012 had many Star Wars fans up in arms, ultimately the pull of new old material was just too strong for the franchise, uh, franchise's continuation not to be a commercial success. So, are we more susceptible to nostalgia today? That's certainly uh, what some scholars have argued. Ryan Lazardi writes that, quote, in today's hypermediated world, technological affordances make it easy to create our own playlist past of downloaded video, uh, vintage video games and DVD box sets of long forgotten television shows. And Mark Fisher also in part tied our nostalgia to technological shifts, uh, writing that in in conditions of digital recall, uh, he, he laments loss is itself lost. An increase in scholarly interest in this area, as demonstrated by this very uh, conference, but also in, for example, the recently published Netflix Nostalgia, Streaming the Past on Demand, uh, edited by Catherine Pallister, suggests that there is something specific to today's media platforms, which have encouraged this move toward a nostalgic culture and with it a nostalgic politics. But what to make of this shift is more challenging. For Lizardi, who coins the term narcissistic nostalgia, um, to help describe an environment in which, quote, new technologies have enabled the inclusion, exclusion, and ordering of individual media texts 
to be played back at any time, often at the cost of the dismissal of collective cultural experiences, we are being, quote, exploited by contemporary media to develop individualized pasts that are defined by idealized versions of beloved lost media texts pumped up with psychic investment to a level of unreality. Thus nostalgia, particularly when considered as an industry tool, becomes a highly conservative force. Rather than bring us closer to our past, it has a tendency to erase certain histories, often the marginal, replacing these with a cathartic, whitewashed and sanitized simulacrum that can be used to escape from a collective guilt and responsibility for today's political confrontations an accusation levelled at Green Book shortly after its release. Christine Sprengler, on the other hand, sees a debate between good and bad nostalgia, I use those words in uh, italicised, um, ultimately uh, is a, fruit, a fruitless debate because of the tendency to assess nostalgia on the basis of its object, which uh, she argues informs nearly all our attempts to evaluate it. So if you, for example, liked Green Book and Stranger Things, then the nostalgia is good nostalgia. If you didn't like them, it's bad nostalgia. Sprengler highlights the changing fortunes of nostalgia in academic criticism over recent decades. In the 1980s and 90s, she argues that Reagan's use of nostalgia, quote, made it difficult for anyone but staunch Republicans to find value in it. Um, it is my contention, however, that we do need to differentiate between good and bad nostalgia, not in terms of whether or not we enjoy a text, but in our consideration of the kind of messages promoted by such material. In some instances, as perhaps with Disney's reboots, nostalgia appears quite benign. In fact, one might argue that with the subtle changes Disney introduced in order to update movies with respect particularly to gender politics, these new old movies help to highlight the flaws in not just the earlier movies, but in society's positioning of women, for example, in the 1990s. Of course, this doesn't mean that the job is now done, but such changes help to highlight ways in which the original movies have themselves dated. Uh, in short, it is, not their take, uh, it is their take rather on identity politics, which seems to have dated faster than the animation techniques themselves. In such an instance, our nostalgia only goes so far. We want to return to the past because we want the excitement of being a child again, but we don't. Uh, but not because we think the past itself was somehow better. Equally, there are some movies like perhaps Green Book, which glamorize aspects of the past through the movie's texture, but which on the narrative level tell a story, the politics of which promotes a reflective distance. There is still the danger that such texts can mislead us. We can become complacent uh, and begin to believe our present politics far superior to that of our parents and grandparents generations. Where I think we should be most suspicious, however, uh, is of nostalgia uh, that, that all, all it kind of provides, if you like, is that texture of the past. So it's entirely depoliticized. So where texts make political commentary in a way only through its absence or the absence of that political commentary. And I'm thinking here of a, a show like Stranger Things or a movie like Ready Player One. Um, and um, probably uh, Tracy might be upset here because I, I guess I'm throwing an accusation at Stranger Things. I, I, I'm a total hypocrite because I love Stranger Things, uh, but I think we should be a bit wary about this kind of nostalgia. So where in these in these uh, in, um, in Stranger Things and of course Ready Player One, the 1980s is evoked not to tell a story about identity politics, although some defenders of the text, Tracy included probably, um, will will argue that elements of that do crop up from time to time. Uh, I would argue that rather they're more interested in uh, luxuriating um, on the past and in a way glamorizing it through such nostalgia. So both Stranger Things and Ready Player One are distinctive for their heavy reliance on what might be termed prosthetic memory. For Alison Landsberg, who coined the term in the early 2000s, prosthetic memory, quote, emerges at the interface between a person and a historical narrative about the past at an experiential site such as a movie theater or museum. In this moment of contact and experience occurs through which the person sutures himself or herself into a larger history, 
In the process, the person does not simply apprehend a historical narrative, but takes on a more personal, deeply felt memory of a past, even through which he or she did not live. Landsberg's ideas go further. She insists that rather than just label prosthetic memories as inauthentic, such memories, in inverted commas, should be valued for their power to, quote, shape that person's subjectivity and politics. So the, the memories themselves are intrinsically valuable because they, they, they are political and, and can shape and, and um, you know, inform people's politics, even if they weren't living through that memory. Um, so Landsberg's theory suggests that even while a subject might not have a direct connection to a remembered event, person or object, the prosthetic memory generated can easily come to inform one's political views. And she reads this in a positive sense. So for example, such empathetic connections can be made to help teach younger people about the horrors of war or genocide. Or we might add of racism and homophobia through a film like Green Book. But when what is being peddled is a 1980s entirely commercialized and absent of its politics, as I would argue is the case in both Stranger Things and Ready Player One, the nostalgia generated hardly seems progressive. As Pam Cook declared uh, of prosthetic memories, even as she attempted to redeem them, quote, such enterprises lay themselves open to charges of lack of authenticity, of substituting a degraded popular version for the real event, uh, and to accusations that by presenting history as dramatic spectacle, they obscure uh, our understanding of social, political and cultural forces. These criticisms seem most applicable where audiences who often have no first-hand experience of a particular period, the 1980s in these examples, are encouraged to consider such times as having, at least in certain instances, a nostalgic simplicity and appeal. Remember when fun was spending all afternoon at the mall. Remember when we went out and did stuff before we were chained to our computers. Or remember when boys were boys and girls were girls. James Berger, despite seeing the value of the ideas behind Landsberg's work on prosthetic memory, identifies the concept as particularly, quote, optimistic and shows a concern that such mem memories often uh, take a kind of commodified form. Quote, products of mass media and the past are not, as Berger arg argues, prosthetic and are not exactly memories. Whether they originate with the testimonies of witness or, uh, witnesses or retrieval of other documents or presentations of artifacts or fictional reconstructions, these products are representations. And as representations, prosthetic memories may promise an access to history that is otherwise unavailable. But it is important to note that they can only ever articulate one interpretation of history. Thus, according to Berger, quote, memory, as Landsberg describes it, as product of corporate capitalist mass media, must be subject to processes of ideology, just as our other mass media products. Often the texture of the past in shows like Stranger Things are all that one needs to develop a distorted understanding of history. As Robert Burgoyne has argued, even as we have become increasingly accustomed to and comfortable with the manipulation of film through digital methods, quote, film appears to have acquired uh, with more than ever the mantle of meaningfulness and authenticity with relation to the past, not necessarily of accuracy or fidelity to the record, but of meaningfulness understood in terms of emotional and effective truth. I mean, um, you know, particularly in this sort of period where, um, you, know, you know, there's a lot of kind of debate about the, the, the truthfulness of our politics, right? So in part, this willingness to enjoy the fantasy of film as offering us a meaningful encounter with history might be seen as a response to our own lack of trust in the fidelity of personal memory. Paul Grange has written that, quote, the desire for memory is stable, reassuring and constant has always been plagued by the fear of its instability and unreliability and its disposition towards fantasy and forgetting. So to, to sum up, um, returning to Burgoyne's observation that movies now seem to offer us, quote, meaningfulness understood in terms of emotional and effective truth, we see the real danger of this type of prosthetic memory. 
it all too easily presents itself to its consumer as a form of truth, particularly today when it has become so difficult to trust anything we are told by politicians. In short, if what we have come to trust is film, particularly younger audience members who have no direct experience of the periods they repeatedly witness in theatres or on television, then it seems important not just to offer texture, but to offer politics alongside this. A period piece absent of politics, I would argue, is in itself political because it embeds nostalgia where nostalgia does not necessarily belong. A stranger sort of nostalgia, perhaps, but a more dangerous and insidious one for it. And that's, that's me, John. Ah, so much to think about there. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so last but not least, we got Craig. Um, so Craig Ian Mann is a lecturer in film and media studies at Sheffield Hallam University. He researches the cultural politics of popular genres, including horror, science fiction, action, the thriller, and the Western. He's author of Phases of the Moon, a cultural history of the werewolf film, and he's contributed to the Journal of Popular Film and Television, Horror Studies, and Science Fiction Film and Television. He's also organizer of the Fear 2000 conference series on contemporary horror media, a conference series close to many of our hearts, I'm sure. Um, so Craig, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Um, hello, folks. So um, it's worth saying from the outset that this paper is part of a new research project. So I'm currently in the very early stages of writing a monograph titled Take Me to Your Leader, Alien Invasion Films in the Reagan Era. And most of the content of this presentation is designed to eventually form part of the introduction to that book. So to introduce that project, its aim is to explore the popular resurgence of alien invasion films in the 1980s and consider their social and cultural dimensions in the context of Ronald Reagan's America. So to that end, the aim of this paper is to examine the connections between alien invasion films of the 1980s and their predecessors in the 1950s and particularly to consider the role of nostalgia in the revival of such a, a distinctive cultural form. After all, when we think of alien invasion narratives, we generally think of the 1950s. In fact, the phrase alien invasion itself has an almost inherently nostalgic quality as it conjures up images of flying saucers and rubber monsters, some of which you can see on the slide here. Um, and that's because the decade was saturated with images of marauding aliens and in many ways defined by narratives in which Americans, normally scientists or soldiers, uh, repelled invaders from Mars. So the first invasion cycle began in 1951 with movies like The Thing from Another World and lasted until roughly 1959 uh, with movies like Plan 9 from Outer Space. So this was a hugely popular genre cycle that lasted for the best part of a decade. And as I'm sure you know, the question of why these films and science fiction movies in general for that matter were so popular in the 1950s is a tale uh, as old as film studies really. So broadly speaking, the popularity uh, of science fiction movies in 1950s America has been linked to the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, uh, the rise of the USSR as a superpower, the onset of the Cold War, and the beginning of the Second Red Scare, or a renewed wave of anti-communist paranoia in the post-war United States. So. Scholars such as Patrick Luciano, Peter Biskind and Cindy Hendershot have argued that science fiction helped the American public to come to terms with fears of nuclear annihilation and communist infiltration by playing out scenarios in which the nation comes under threat from giant monsters, irradiated insects, or for our purposes, alien invaders. Uh, so Andrew Tudor provides quite a neat summary of those readings in his essay, Why Horror?, where he says, it is common to examine 1950s science fiction an interlinked cluster of themes, including the threat of alien invasion, the risks of nuclear power, and the roles of science and scientists. Typically, it is argued that such films articulate distinctive American fears apparent in both the public discourse and private lives of the period. Alien invasions were a particularly ubiquitous theme, and that's perhaps in part due to the sudden explosion of UFO sightings that occurred in the late 1940s and early 1950s. So as sightings dramatically increased and continued to receive national press coverage, they fueled the nation's fears of infiltration or outright invasion by foreign agents. And the, uh, the flying saucer became a perfect metaphor through which to communicate uh, that paranoia. <laughs> 
Perhaps not surprisingly then, it has often been said that the alien invasion films produced in the 1950s were incredibly conservative. Uh, so Cold War texts that expressed a fear of communist invasion and the erosion of the so-called American way of life. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. I think there are plenty of films that take a far more progressive approach to the alien invasion theme, uh, but given that I'm on the clock right now, suffice it to say that many of these films have been considered to express the dominant ideology of the 1950s. So the three movies here, for example, we've got Invaders from Mars from 1953, Invasion of the Body Snatchers from 1956, and It Conquered the World from 1956, um, all feature aliens that hijack human minds and could easily be interpreted, therefore, as, art as articulations of America's kind of anti-communist paranoia. Uh, invasion narratives like the films on this slide remained popular until the dawn of the 1960s. But as America moved into a new decade and the never-ending Cold War became a simple fact of life, their popularity quickly waned. So invasion stories were mainstays of shows like The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits and The Invaders, but they were no longer popular on the big screen. In fact, America produced only a handful of invasion films over the next two decades. Uh, the most uh, notable are Close Encounters of the Third Kind and the first remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, both of which were released in the latter years of the 1970s. And in fact, they presaged an obsession with aliens in the popular culture of the next decade, when invasion narratives were soon to find a new popularity that they hadn't enjoyed for 20 years. can see from the, uh, the, the many examples here, the 1980s produced a second invasion cycle uh, and the sheer volume of these films released between 1980 and 1989 suggests that there's something of a cultural phenomenon here that needs to be explored. Uh, so the films on this slide are just a few of the many that were released during Reagan's presidency um, and all films in which aliens come to earth with malevolent intent and uh, undoubtedly, you will already be thinking of other examples, probably The Thing uh, and They Live, two movies that are better known and uh, more frequently studied than the films on the last slide due to their association with uh, John Carpenter. And this is a cultural obsession that's not just limited to cinema. It is widespread in the pop culture of the, uh, of the 1980s. So to give a few examples, we only need to look at the popularity of arcade games like Space Invaders and Phoenix, or the television show V, which concentrates on a particularly insidious invasion of Earth. By the end of the 1980s, the best-selling horror writer Stephen King had explored the invasion theme in The Tommyknockers. And even one of the decade's most popular sitcoms, ALF, uh, was about a family learning to live with the foul-mouthed cat-eating alien who crashes his ship into their shed. Uh, so aliens were to be found pretty much everywhere in 1980s media, uh, media that clearly owed a great deal to the popular culture of the 1950s. After all, the alien invasion films of the 1980s are directly influenced by their predecessors, and in some ways literally so. So from the late 1970s through to the end of the next decade, four direct remakes of 1950s invasion films were produced. Invasion of the Body Snatchers in 1978, The Thing in 1982, Invaders from Mars 1986, and The Blob in 1988. And we could also, of course, add The Fly to that as well. And of course, countless others lift directly from 1950s movies. So for example, The Hidden and They Live are both riffs on the original uh, body snatchers. And by the mid-1980s, there was a clear cultural obsession with these films. So see, for example, uh, the contents of this 1986 issue of Fangoria. So it begins with an interview with John Agar, the star of 1950s invasion movies such as The Brain from Planet Aris and Invisible Invaders, which sets the tone for an issue that then goes on to discuss uh, no less than four invasion movies that were released in 1986, Night of the Creeps, Critters, Invaders from Mars, and Maximum Overdrive. And in the case of Maximum Overdrive, that's kind of a spoiler, so sorry. Um, and in fact, beyond a preoccupation with invasion narratives, the popular culture of Ronald Reagan's America was obsessed with the 1950s in general. So I'm just providing a few examples here. We've got Back to the Future, the second iteration of The Twilight Zone, uh, Stand By Me, etc. Uh, and there are many more films and television shows with a clear relationship to the 1950s. Uh, in Reagan's America, popular culture often cast its eyes backwards to a time before Vietnam, Watergate, the sexual revolution, and the counterculture. And I would argue that the reasons for that have everything to do with Reagan himself. Um, so his familiar 1980 campaign slogan, which we've, we've already seen, uh, 
and uh, obviously was borrowed by uh, Donald Trump, was entirely based on a sense of erasing the so-called excesses of the 1960s and 1970s and returning to an uh, apparently simpler or, or a greater time. Um, of course, Reagan himself was heavily identified with the 1950s due to his acting career and his association with Westerns, and his policies also recalled that earlier decade in line with the rise of uh, the New Right, uh, a conservative movement that supported Ronald Reagan's election campaign. So as Michael Schaller states, uh, whether they had a religious, secular or congressional background, New Right activists believed that environmentalism, arms control, gun control, abortion rights, gay rights, feminism, welfare, affirmative action, pornography and the Equal Rights Amendment uh, all fostered a destructive permissiveness that undermined the value of family, church and state. And uh, in addition to traditional values, Reagan promised financial security. After nearly a decade of economic turmoil, his policies comprising tax cuts, privatization, and a raft of financial deregulation were intended to reinvigorate the American dream, or in other words, restore that 1950s idea of America as a wealthy and pro uh, prosperous nation. He also reignited the Cold War, refusing to look weak on the world stage. So Reagan successfully secured the White House in the 1980 presidential election by embracing atavistic values, his notion of America constructed on the ideals of the nuclear family, social conservatism, religious morality, military strength, and the pursuit of material wealth, or in short, as James E. Coombs states. Reagan came to political prominence uh, as a cultural spokesman for the Eisenhower normalcy of the extended era of the 1950s and presented himself as the principal cultural authority who, as father of the first family, knew best. So here's the big question then. Are the alien invasion films of the 1980s just nostalgia films in the Frederick Jameson sense? Uh, do they rehash an older cultural form to reinforce the dominant ideology of the Reagan era? Are they, in the words of Jay Hoberman in his recent book on Reaganite cinema, symptomatic of a culture in which, thanks to cinema and television, the past had become a collection of images readily evoked by outmoded styles of consumption, discarded fashions and obsolete attitudes in which popular cinema was, uh, quote, not only reassuring, but regressive. Um, my short answer to that question is no. Uh, and in fact, I'd say they satirize the larger cultural obsession with the 1950s. Um, the first example I would use to combat this idea or the idea that these are nostalgia films uh, is They Live, which owes everything to 1950s infiltration narratives and particularly invasion of the body snatches. It concentrates on a working class everyman who discovers that Earth has been colonized by aliens hiding in plain sight. But these aliens are not metaphors for communist invaders. In fact, they're venture capitalists. Um, so they control the human race with subliminal advertising, driving them to work, spend and sustain the economy for the alien elite. Uh, it's impossible to read this as a straightforwardly nostalgic film in the Jameson sense of the word. It lifts narrative and aesthetic elements from earlier movies, but it uses them to attack Reagan's values. Um, of course, I'm by far not the first person to say that, uh, and even Hoberman acknowledges the left-leaning politics of They Live, which was not only anti-Reagan, but very popular and very profitable. However, uh, he argues that it's the exception rather than the rule, and goes on to say, uh, They Live quickly faded, as did the sort of topical metal genre um, but the problem with Hoberman's argument is that they live isn't the only exception. So, for example, we can read another 1980s film, uh, The Hidden, in exactly the same way. So in The Hidden, a body-snatching alien parasite jumps from person to person looking for nothing but short-term gratification. It loves cash, fast cars, loud music, and expensive electronics. It's essentially an extraterrestrial yuppie and eventually sees the opportunity to increase its power by jumping into the body of a presidential candidate. So it's quite difficult to read these films as being politically regressive. And in fact, I would say that this is true for the majority of the 1980s cycle. These films do borrow a cultural form commonly associated with the conservative 1950s, but they often do so in order to satirise and critique Reagan's atavistic policies and back-to-basics rhetoric. So, to evidence that point further, I'm going to finish by briefly discussing three of the 1980s invasion films that I think would be most likely to be considered straightforwardly nostalgic, because all three of them have an explicit narrative connection to the 1950s. But rather than lionizing the 50s as a, a kind of golden age, they, vici they viciously attack this apparently simpler time to indict rather than to embrace the pervading uh, nostalgia of the Reagan era. So those films are, as you can see on this slide, Strange Invaders, 
uh, The Visitants and Night of the Creeps. So we'll start with the earliest film, Strange Invaders, which was released in 1983. The film opens in 1958 and immediately presents us with idealized images of small town America. The first scene takes place in Centerville, Illinois, a quaint community filled with large detached houses, carefully tended gardens and mom and pop diners. It is in short, an inherently nostalgic vision of 1950s Americana, but importantly, it's one we're clearly not supposed to take seriously because our reading of these images is guided by a satirical text crawl that dominates the image and lampoons that rose-tinted vision of the 1950s that conservatives embraced 30 years later. So it reads, it was a simple time of Eisenhower, twin beds and Elvis from the waist up, a safe, quiet moment in history. As a matter of fact, except for the communists and rock and roll, there was not much to fear, not much at all until that night. And what happens on that night is that in a nod to Body Snatchers, Centerville is invaded by alien shapeshifters who replace all of the town's inhabitants. The rest of the film takes place 25 years later when a university lecturer visits the town in search of his missing ex-wife. When he arrives in Centerville, he finds that it has not changed at all since 1958. The buildings, the people, the fashions, the cars, Everything has been frozen in time since the 1950s, but it soon becomes clear that this is only a facsimile of that apparently idyllic decade. Underneath the town's picturesque facade, every single one of its residents is an otherworldly invader with an insidious agenda, something that is made clear when they quite literally tear off their skin to reveal their true appearance, which looks like this. Centerville, then, is a metaphor for Reagan's America. Just as Reagan used a reassuring but ultimately false memory of the 1950s to usher in this new age of right-wing conservatism, this is a town that seems to be perfect from the outside. But then the townspeople reveal their true faces, and it becomes clear that everything in Centerville, just like that satirical opening text that speaks of a safe, quiet moment in history, is a lie. So Strange Invaders was followed in 1986 by The Visitants, which has a fairly similar premise, but a more kind of obviously comedic tone. So the beginning of the film takes place in 1956, when two aliens arrive on Earth to begin a 30-year reconnaissance mission. They embed themselves in sleepy suburbia and wait patiently for an invasion force to follow them. In the three decades that pass, the world changes, but importantly, the aliens don't. Having taken the guise of a middle-aged couple native to the Eisenhower era, in 1986, they are still watching a tube television, dressing in 1950s fashions and behaving as if they live in a twisted version of a family sitcom. So at one point, they try to infiltrate their neighbor's home by appearing at the window and demanding to borrow a cup of sugar, for example. So they are preparing for the arrival of their planet's invasion force when that neighbor, a high school senior, discovers their true nature and steals their high-tech laser gun, which then leads the aliens on a quest to destroy the teenager and his friends. So what follows is a farcical battle between alien invaders representative of the traditional 1950s, who want to repopulate Earth with their own kind, and a much younger generation who symbolize hope for the future if that effort fails. So in other words, the visitants is clearly, uh, sorry, is using a clearly defined generational conflict to allegorize the uh, efforts of the Reagan administration to impress its outmoded values on the young. And this is especially clear when one of the aliens assumes the guise of a teenager to infiltrate the group. Group. And to reinforce that point further, the parents of the film's teenagers are also stuck in the 1950s in their fashions, their speech and their attitudes, and are constantly talking of the good old days of their youth. So tellingly then, they're just as alien to their children as the literal extraterrestrials who are trying to take over their town. A generational conflict also plays out in Night of the Creeps, another film released in 1986. Um, again, as has become a pattern by now, the film begins in the 1950s. So, it opens with a sequence that borrows the monochrome aesthetics of science fiction B-movies, lifting plot elements from movies like The Blob, The Brain Eaters, and Plan 9 from Outer Space. On a summer's night in sleepy suburbia, parasitic space slugs fall to Earth, where they worm their way into human brains and turn their hosts into murderous zombies. Um, the original host is cryogenically frozen in 1959, only to be thawed out 27 years later by a group of college students, at which point the slugs quickly begin to multiply. <laughs> 
As they spread through the town, the slugs begin to turn human bodies into mindless vessels for their alien hosts, attacking young and old alike and infecting the entire community. The fact that these mind-controlling creatures are safely contained in 1959, only to be unleashed again in the mid-1980s, is a particularly potent metaphor for the insidious return of conservative ideology under Ronald Reagan. And to ensure that that commentary isn't missed, one elderly victim is killed in her home while a film originally released in 1959, Plan 9 from Outer Space, plays on television, her death set to the eerie sound of the theremin. And to clearly connect Night of the Creeps with the visitants, its final scenes literalise that generational conflict as a group of college kids are forced to stage a final showdown with the aliens within the walls of a fraternity house. The only central character who was even alive during the 1950s is a grizzled police detective, and although he helps to repel the alien invaders, he's another relic of the past, and so perhaps inevitably uh, he's dead before the end credits. So all three of these narratives concentrate on an alien menace that arrives on Earth in the 1950s before wreaking havoc 30 years later, and in doing so they clearly indict Reagan's desire to turn back the clock. If we return to that earlier question then, these are definitely not nostalgia films in the Jameson sense. Um, they are much better understood I think, as post or critical nostalgia films, or examples of what Bernice Murphy refers to as the anti-nostalgia films of the 1980s. So in her work on Back to the Future, Murphy suggests that 1980s movies like Parents and Blue Velvet subvert sanitized nostalgic representations of the 1950s and of the cultural and consumerist implications of the suburban existence in general. And to some extent, I think that describes films like Strange Invaders, The Visitants and Night of the Creeps. But honestly, I'd argue that even that term doesn't quite work for these movies. After all, there is a clear sense of straightforward dictionary definition nostalgia to the alien invasion films of the 1980s. They all revel in the bubblegum aesthetics of the 1950s and are enamored with a cultural form that was kind of birthed in that decade. But importantly, they are far from enamored with the regressive politics that invasion films are often thought to represent. And I can expand on the reasons for that if anybody wants to ask in the Q&A. But for now, I think that's probably all I've got time for. So thank you very much for listening. Okie doke, great, wow. I'm sure there are going to be lots and lots of questions. We have until 10 to six. So just under um, 20 minutes. All right, um, so either put your hands up or put uh, something in the chat. We've got one already from Christina to Matt. Uh, in some cases, it seems that nostalgia is used as an excuse to immerse in and mediate more traditional norms, particularly gender and race, such as Tarantino's Once Upon a Time that you mentioned, whereas others seem to function as a way to resus as a resituate particular identities that were perhaps marginalized or ignored in texts in the original time. Do you think that this links to the ideas of good and bad nostalgia you mentioned, or do you think it represents the political use of nostalgia from opposite sides? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think that, um, I mean, it, this kind of uh, discussion turned up earlier. We were talking about, um, we were talking about Lovecraft Country, and we were talking about the, um, the idea that sort of these these texts are rewriting history in some way or trying to sort of rewrite the past or um, showcase that the past wasn't as, as wonderful um, as it perhaps is, you know, seen to be. But I, I, my, my issue is that what was always running up against that is the aesthetics of the text, which seems to uh, overwhelm um, this notion that the past is something that we should be suspicious of because it's, it glamorizes it doing that. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the politics of this, I think that that's um, as nostalgia is deeply personal. You know, uh, I, I think Sprengler is kind of getting at that. You know, if you are someone on the right of the spectrum, your sense of nostalgia might be that kind of simplicity when you know when white masculinity was at its peak, versus someone else's nostalgia, which might be. Um, you know, uh, 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 something entirely different, might want to rewrite that narrative. Um, and um, so, I, so I think you're right. I think embedded in that is is actually, you know, pers the politics of the, the maker, of the, the filmmaker or the uh, TV uh, producers themselves. So um, I'm not sure if I really answered that question, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that there is necessarily a clear answer to that. Um, whether I've even understood the question, I think is another, <laughs> another query we might have. But, 
Yep. All right. Uh, Liam, have you got one? Uh, yeah, sorry, I've just typed it, but uh, I can I can ask it verbally as well. I was just uh, wondering about the, um, this is for Craig, um, just wondering about the recent um, spate of alien invasion movies, sort of like, like Skyline and the, the post uh, Cloverfield saga, um, and whether or not there's any sort of analogue to what you discussed uh, with the, you know, with the 80s movies, the 80s alien invasion movies, calling back to the 50s, whether or not there's any analogue there with the contemporary movies, because I haven't seen a lot. I just know there's a lot of them, but, you know. I think a lot of those more recent movies, like Battle Battle LA and Battleship and uh, Skyline, as you mentioned, um, are probably more accurately read as sort of, um, you know, post 9-11 war on terror movies, really, um, because they, they kind of follow that. In the, I love Independence Day, don't get me wrong, but Independence Day is is quite conservative in a lot of ways, I think. And I think what those movies are doing is harking back to alien invasion movies in the um, Independence Day mode. Um, it's very much about uh, America being directly under attack and efforts to repel them. Um, and there's so much uh, concentration in those movies recently, like Battle LA and Battleship. Uh, perhaps not Skyline, actually, because that does concentrate only on a small group of people in an apartment. Um, but the kind of big budget movies are about the American military quashing uh, an alien invasion. So I, I, the more recent stuff, as much as I love them, um, they are alien invasion movies. Even the more recent ones are my comfort food. Uh, I think the more recent ones from the the, the last decade or so um, are very kind of supportive of American militarism uh, and American foreign policy. And in that regard, I think there's something a little bit different. I hope that answers your question. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we've got a question from Mike. I don't know if he wants to say it or whether I should just read it out. Mike, if you're there. Yeah, happy to read it out. Um, it was just something uh, thinking about just a, a notion, really. Um, and I'm wondering about the, I found Stranger Things really odd. Um, I, I, there's something straight, weirdly conservative about its approach to the world and its thought of the world. So my question was simply, is the nostalgia evident in Stranger Things and its longing for the Reagan 80s, the cultural Reagan 80s, not Reagan himself? Um, is, it a, is there a congruency or equivalency of the 80s films that hark back to the 1950s? Is Stranger Things like a kind of closeted cultural Reaganism? Just a thought. I mean, I don't know if that's directed at me or Craig, but I mean, um, I, I happily speak to, to something about that, which is, uh, which actually came up in a conversation earlier uh, um, on um, Krista's paper and um, on Ready Player One, um, which is essentially that, you know, um, with these texts looking back, uh, I don't know that they really, um, engage at all with politics and that shirking of politics is really um, problematic because the 1980s itself um, was kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a really kind of for, for liberals particularly, it's the source of a lot of our kind of problems with today's society, the birth of neoliberalism perhaps, you know. Um, but, but the other thing to sort of say about that is um, uh, that I think with, with Stranger Things, um, because it's so Spielbergian, you know, it kind of it draws on Spielberg in so many ways, including Spielberg's con conservatism. So, um, you know, the, the idea being you know, Spielberg himself loves the 80s. And, and I, I quoted from an interview um, with him earlier um, that, that he basically says he, he loved the 80s and it was a boomtown decade for him. And it, of course, it was a boomtown decade for him because he made an absolute bunch of money off, off a load of off a load of, you know, uh, cheesy sort of conservative films so um, in, in that regard I think in that way you might see Stranger Things as, as, as Spielbergian not just in terms of its style and in terms of its narrative but also in terms of its conservative politics which you know is itself perhaps you know Spielberg looking back to the 50s is is you know Stranger Things looking back to the 80s. And if that question was aimed at me sorry to say it um, yeah. I completely dif disagree with Matthew entirely. Um, okay. I, um, I, I, Stranger Things, I think, is harking back to the 1980s, but I also think that we can't say that all 1980s films are aggressive and conservative. Um, it, Stranger Things, 
uh, references, say, The Stuff and Gremlins. Those are two films that I, I can't think of more anti-consumerist movies than The Stuff and Gremlins. Um, I also don't necessarily agree that E.T. is a conservative movie either. I mean, it is entirely about uh, the tyranny of the government who is trying to take a child's best friend away from him. Um, so, you know, I think there are lots of lots of 1980s movies that are far more politically progressive than we give them credit for. There is this sense that the 1980s is a regressive decade because it, the dominant ideology was regressive. But we have to remember that people who were making movies in the 1980s were generally born in the 1950s and raised on 1950s, early 1960s pop culture, but then grew up and became teenagers and went into their 20s during the 1960s and the 1970s, and therefore kind of experienced that decade um, that was being talked about in that paper on, on it, which I thought was fantastic. Um, uh, where America, you know, entered into the culture wars. I mean, uh, Joe Dante, who worked with Steven Spielberg several times uh, and with Amblin Entertainment several times, um, has, you know, gone on the record saying that he grew up in the 1950s and, and, and consumed all of that media. And one of his greatest, uh, one of his favourite films is It Came From Beneath the Sea. But then during the 60s and the 70s, he was in some ways politically rat radicalised by seeing things like Kent State, seeing the Chicago police riot. And that's why when you watch Joe Dante's movies, there are politics there. They're not, they're not necessarily on the surface. That's what, you know, subtext is subtext. Um, but anyway, that's my answer to that question. So you've got complete, two completely yeah. different answers to that question and you can take whichever one you like, Mike. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Craig. And thanks very much, Matthew. It's only one other thing I'd, I'd comment on. There's something really odd about the way that it works and the way that we refer to Stranger Things as well as a sound designer and I, I work in sound mostly, um, is that the, really the reference is not Spielberg for Stranger Things, it's John Carpenter. And when you add that John Carpenter to the fundamental strange conservatism that there is going on in Stranger Things, um, I, for me, uh, it's really interesting to have chosen Carpenter as a, as a sonic reference, but yeah. All right, moving on. So we've got Tom and then Cody. So Tom first. Hi, um, so my question is directed towards Craig. Um, and obviously I really enjoyed that paper and obviously really well put together well designed powerpoint which i always appreciate thanks um, mate. so i guess my my question is kind of obviously I, I know you mentioned that the project is in its early kind of stages um and obviously looking at the 80s as a, as a decade the various political kind of um ideologies and all the kind of reactions to that via cinema um, mm -hmm. and the alien invasion films i was just kind of wondering um when you have films like obviously you mentioned they live coming out in obviously 88 but then you've also got things like Predator, I guess, slightly before that in 87, and my all-time favourite, uh, Mac and Me, um, <laughs> in 88 as well, which which isn't necessarily uh, an invasion film in the strictest sense, I guess. Um, yeah. But I suppose my question is kind of, is there a sense, or, or do you sense that there is maybe a, a transition uh, towards the, the, the Bush presidency in 89 from the films that you're kind of talking about? Um, I think there is, there is some very interesting stuff in 89 and 90 in terms of moving over to the to the Bush administration and stuff. A lot of the stuff towards the end of the 19th. So how the book's going to work is I'm basically going to do thematic chapters about various parts of, uh, of Reagan ideology and how the alien invasion film um, negotiates them. But towards the end of the 80s and into the 1990s, there's a real spate of films. So you mentioned Predator. I'm going to mention Predator 2. Um, Predator 2, uh, I Come in Peace, or Dark Angel, as it's sometimes known, uh, movies like Peacemaker. There's loads of movies that inexplicably throw aliens into um, narratives that also feature drugs and drug dealers. Um, and so I think towards the end of the 80s and into the 90s, there's a real obsession with kind of the war on drugs, which is obviously something that's coming in towards the end of that decade. So one of the later chapters will be on that. But in terms of whether there's a like kind of an overall political transition, um, uh, no, I don't think so. I think there's, you know, it's, it's something the alien invasion boom is something that lasts for pretty much the entirety of the 1980s and then starts to drift away in the early 1990s. And there are some films that, are, that I think um, can be interpreted as, as slightly more conservative. Predator maybe being one of them. I mean, we could get into that conversation, but I've, there are other questions that people want to ask. Um, and Last Starfighter maybe being one of them as well. But uh, I think on the whole, these films are, are, are really quite critical of the Reagan 80s. And, and generally speaking, it kind of relates to what I was saying in relation to the Stranger Things question. I think the people who made these movies um, are nostalgic for the uh, aesthetics and narratives of the films they grew up with, but not not nostalgic for the politics that went with them. Here's All one. Right. 
Tom, do you want to just quickly get in there? I, was just, I think he was just I saying was thank just, you. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> Cheers, Tom, thanks. All right, Cody. Yeah, I've got a question for Bruce. Um, so I, I really liked your presentation. Um, I, I don't know all that much about Chinese media, um, but I thought it was really interesting that you drew the connections between uh, you know, the man-child films that are coming out in China and then of course Hollywood. So my question for you is um, normally uh, the man-child seems to be a character type that's reserved for men in the US. There, there's not, or in Hollywood films, there's not a whole lot of examples of female man or female children or you know man child or whatever however you want to call it do you see that same trend in China are there any examples like in in Hollywood there was I know Charlize Theron was a young adult and that she was kind of like you know regressed from a trauma and became more childish do you see anything like that in Chinese media uh yeah I think gender is an issue for the studies of the Ben Chao troupe. I remember it is mentioned in uh, Balduji's book. Uh, there's a chapter about uh, woman child. Uh, and uh, there's a problem uh, which is related to kind of gender bias is that uh, when, and when a woman uh, is uh, sometimes shows innocent or some traits that would be uh, labeled as childish or childlike when they appear as a, on a man's body, it would not uh, be recalling the sense of uh, childlikeness when it appears in the body of a female, uh, which is uh, related to kind of gender bias, I think. But then, uh, so it would make it less dramatic or make it less comical in terms of the effect that uh, comedy filmmakers would like to make when they try to design uh, uh, woman child characters. And uh, while in China, I think it is something similar, which is also related to gender bias. Uh, actually, uh, in my studies of uh, Chinese comedy films, at least uh, in the reform period, most of the comedians and filmmakers of comedies in China are men. And most of those comedies are male-oriented or male-centered, except for uh, romantic comedies that uh, appear and developed in the recent decade, um, which also include both uh, female actors and female filmmakers. But uh, also observe that uh, and other gender bias, maybe that uh, for the actress or, or actors in those romantic comedies or female centered comedies in China nowadays, those uh, actors or actresses are not themselves comedians. It's like uh, they're just stars. They can also, they are also uh, uh, performing in other genres unlike those com male comedians who play most comedy films uh, in their works. So uh, I'm, I'm also observing both in China and Hollywood comedy for uh, the woman child troupe. If they really appear or, or if they also appear Okay, yeah, I, was, I kind of figured that it might be, you know, something like that because there's not even very many, you know, uh, uh, examples that I know of in, in Hollywood filmmaking. So I wondered if it was similar. So yeah, thank you. Thank you.